Hi everybody, welcome to Just Thinking Out Loud. My name is Desiree. I am speaking with Brendan Marotta today, who is the filmmaker for American Circumcision, a movie that you might have seen. And I'm going to allow him to introduce himself so we can get the conversation going right now. Hi everyone, my name is Brendan Marotta. I am the director of American Circumcision, a feature length documentary on the modern circumcision debate in America and the growing movement that believes that all human beings should be able to make their own choices about their bodies. Okay, uh, so my first question to you would be, and I'm sure for anyone listening, is how did you get involved in this issue and what led you, what steps led you to the point that you are at right now? So I think like most people, circumcision wasn't something I thought about a lot. It was not something I even expected to make a documentary about. But I went through a period where I was learning a lot about early life psychology and about how things that happen to us in childhood affect us later on. And as I was doing that research, I would run across information on circumcision. And, you know, it always bothered me a little bit. But one of the things that I found was that the procedure was often done without anesthesia. And so here I am, I'm reading about things about how, you know, if you don't hold a child or you shame them when they're young, that creates patterns later on in life. What impact must holding down a child and cutting off part of his body have? And then, you know, I, you know, I just sort of thought, well, that's really uncomfortable. That's really unsettling, but there's nothing I can do about that now. So I kind of pushed it out of sight, out of mind. And then as I was researching, I also started finding something called foreskin restoration, where men take the remaining skin that they have and they stretch it over time to get a covering of that again. And I thought, wait a minute, I've been told my whole life there's nothing you can do about this, but clearly there's something that lots of men are doing about it. What else have I not been told? And so that led to all of the research that eventually became the film. Um, just because I realized I had what one of my interview subjects calls the obsessive epiphany, which is the moment when you realize there's more to an issue than your culture has presented. And I suspect that your audience has gone through an obsessive epiphany around many other issues. And so I went through that with uh, this issue of circumcision. I read everything I could on it, every book, every article, every podcast, every YouTube show, and thought, why is it that the world doesn't know this information? And so that information then became the film later. Okay. Um, so could you kind of describe what information, maybe not in detail because you want people to go watch the film if they haven't seen it, what kind of information is novel that a lot of people don't know that you think they might find out if they watch the film? But so part of the, detail. yeah, part of the challenge of circumcision isn't that people don't know anything. It's that people know a lot of misinformation. So if you ask a person about circumcision, they'll tell you it's, at least in America, They'll tell you it's cleaner, it's healthier, um, it's just a tiny bit that's removed or nothing at all, nothing of importance. The child doesn't feel it, he doesn't remember it, there's no lasting impact, it doesn't change sexuality at all. And yet when you look at the research, virtually the opposite of every one of those points is true. So it's often done without anesthesia, it's a long involved 15 minute process that's extremely painful for the child. It removes the most sensitive tissue on a man's body and there's a whole host of ethical issues brought up with the fact that you are removing part of someone else's body without their consent. So when I started researching the issue, what I found is, you know, in the media, it's presented as this one time decision that parents make that you never have to think about again. And in reality, it's more like throwing a stone in a pond. It's something that ripples out throughout a man's life. It affects his relationships, his sexuality, his self-image, his, his view of his own body. It affects all of these cultural institutions. It affects law and religion and government and medicine. And this is the most common surgery in America. So how could it not affect the majority of the population when it's done on the majority of men? So what I found in my research is that this is framed as a fringe issue or something that is small or minute or doesn't really affect people because and in fact it affects most people yeah i um i watched the the film and uh, a couple things stood out to me and you started this conversation with doing research on how early childhood experiences influence um later adulthood and then you're also describing how it's, it's more like uh, a ripple in a pond and 
some key moments in the film for me were I can't remember the name of the the names of the individuals speaking, but one person was saying that it was the baby's first shared sexual experience and that it was where um sex and violence came together for the very first time and I thought that was wow that's kind of intense to, to think about and then also speaking about how um, circumcision changes how sex occurs between a man and a woman and how it it creates more separation I guess would be the way to describe it and um, something about the strokes being different which I can't remember all the details but it changes this vital very intimate experience that you could have with another human being and that's something that's going to last forever in your lifetime so i i definitely think that people trying to minimize the impact that it can have on an individual's life is is not good um so that's something that stood out those are things that stood out to me when I, i watched the film yeah the the psychological impact and the sexual impact i find are the two aspects that people are most curious about so when a child is born their first developmental task, if you will, is to bond with the mother. Children are born, you know, human children are born earlier than than other animals might be, or earlier than, than you think that they would, because if we were to wait till later, the head of the child could literally not fit out of the woman. So children are tied to their mother for the first few parts of their life. And during that time, they are learning about the world. They're developing sort of fundamental attitudes and and things that can change their behavior later. And this has been scientifically studied. So one of the studies that we reference in the film is a study in which children were vaccinated later and they found that one group of children responded dramatically to the pain of vaccination. So when they put the needle in for the vaccination, one group had this big dramatic overreaction. And they were trying to figure out what group it was. You know, was it children who'd been breastfed or children who didn't or children who were held more? And what they found was that it was children who'd been circumcised who had this dramatic reaction. And the researchers attributed that to post-traumatic stress disorder because these children had a traumatic experience during circumcision in which they were given a lot of pain and then they felt pain later and it triggered the memory of that earlier pain. So a change in behavior is a form of memory. And that is a study that even the most pro-circumcision researchers that I've interviewed will acknowledge is true and good. And in fact, it's influenced the policy of groups like the AAP because they now recommend, they say you're supposed to use anesthesia. Now the anesthesia they use is not effective and that's a whole other story. Um, And they ignore other things like, you know, you mentioned the idea that this is a shared sexual experience. When they circumcise a child, one of the first things they do is they rub iodine on the child's genitals. They rub something that's basically to make sure it doesn't, you know, what you would do before any surgical procedure. And you're rubbing that skin on the body and it has the natural reaction you'd expect. And so if we were to touch the genitals of another gender, that we were to touch women's genitals that way, I think people would have a real problem with it. But because it's boys, we don't even think about that. And I think part of the challenge with circumcision is that people have a mental image in their mind that is very different from the reality. You know, if you say, well, it's cutting off this part of the body, people like when you hear that word cutting, what do you think? You think like you take a pair of scissors and do that, you know, you just snip it off. In reality, it's an involved surgical procedure the foreskin is fused to the head of the glands. They have to break it away and it takes around 15 minutes and they apply this clamp that applies thousands of tons of pressure. And when you look at it from that perspective, it's like, why are we doing this to a child? This does not make sense. And then on top of that, there's the sexual impact of the fact that the foreskin is extremely sensitive, is the most nerve laden part of a man's body, the most nerve endings of anywhere on the male body. And the foreskin is designed to glide in and out of itself. So during sex, during intercourse, the foreskin is rolling over the head of the penis. And every time it does that, it's, you know, those nerves are being stimulated. When that's removed, then you don't have that gliding sensation. And so the man has to stimulate himself through long strokes in the woman. So instead of two layers of skin constantly being stimulated, there's one layer that's being stimulated only through the friction of sex. And so the man has to create more friction 
in order to get the same amount of stimulation or something comparable. I mean, it actually can't be the same because you don't have the same nerve endings. So he's working harder with less stimulation. And, you know, that changes sex for both partners. Yeah, I, I think it's something that it, it seems, once you really hear about it, it seems so vital and important to society because it's, it's at least in America, it's half of the, the population almost. Not, not exactly because not everybody does, but it's a right. really high proportion of, a significant proportion of the population. And um, I, I keep wanting to go back to the impact on later adulthood. Um, something else that stood out to me in the, the film was that people used to think that babies don't feel pain. Like, I, I heard that and I was like, what? That, that sounds so ridiculous. But doctors, medical doctors used to think that. Uh, that's that's kind of a, um, a, amazing. But yeah, I think it's something that society is blind to. And I'm really glad that your film is out and that people can learn more. There's a lot I didn't know about this the the gliding um the, the the mechanics of it i didn't really fully understand that myself um could you talk a bit about the procedure itself because i watched and i i had tears in my eyes like when i i was and they, they blurred stuff out so you couldn't see everything and it was still it was obvious it was just it was like you were watching someone being being tortured and and i guess like as doctors or people in the medical profession you have to not you have to, but eventually you become somewhat desensitized. But it's something that I guess goes on, not behind closed doors, but kind of behind closed doors for very frequently. And I think not actually seeing it, because you don't actually see it, but sort of seeing it with a bit of the the visual censorship that happens in your film, I think is a very different experience than simply hearing about it, like what you were saying. Could you like describe a bit what actually happens? In those yeah, a lot, of, a lot of the activists I've interviewed say that seeing the procedure for the first time is what made them become activists on this issue. So the version on Netflix is blurred, the version on other platforms is not. And when we did a tour with the film, there's a graphic on screen that says, you know, we're about to show the procedure and that the full procedure is 20 minutes and we're only going to show you two minutes. And every screening we did, there's two or three people who would step outside and then they just knew for those two minutes that was not something that they were going to be able to watch. Their uh, constitution was not one that could handle seeing something that graphic. And there's usually a few people who cry during that scene. And yet, the version that we show in the film is what you might call a best case scenario for circumcision. So it's one where the doctor is really conscious of the pain aspect and actually uses anesthesia the way that you're supposed to. And many activists who've been involved on the issue for a while say, that was a lot less graphic than I thought it would be. You know, is you can actually go on YouTube and see versions of the procedure that are much more graphic than that. And yet the people I know who've never seen one before, when they see it, they go, that was really intense. Like that was almost more than I could handle. And so the procedure itself, you know, the foreskin is fused to the head of the glands, kind of like how your fingernail is fused to your finger. So the first thing they have to do is use a blunt probe and break that away. And I mean, you can imagine if you were to put object between your fingernail and your finger, that's really painful. So that's the first thing that they do. And usually when the, you see video of the procedure, that's when the child's dramatic reaction begins. That's when they start screaming and screaming in a way that you do not hear children scream. So there's one sound that a child makes when he's uncomfortable or he wants attention or he wants uh, to be fed. It's not that sound. This is a distress call. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there is a clamp applied. Uh, usually it's something called a gomco clamp that applies thousands of tons of pressure to the foreskin to a circle around it and sits on there for five minutes to basically make it so that the doctor can cut that part of the body away. But it's on there for five minutes 
and you have to wait five minutes for it. So for five minutes, there's thousands of tons of pressure on that part of the body. And some doctors will tell you that the child sleeps right through the procedure. And when that happens, what's really happening is that the child, because he cannot escape physically, is escaping psychologically. So there are some children who scream through the whole thing, and then there are some who simply can't handle it and just check out. Like, they go somewhere else because it's too painful for them to psychologically be present in their body during that. And then that part is cut away. So then that's when they actually do that. And, and people think that the circumcision scar is the only effect that this has. In reality, everything above the scar is scar tissue because the head of the penis itself had to have the foreskin you know, pushed away from it. Again, like the way you pull a fingernail off. So when you just, for some people just seeing the procedure, it's like, that sounds awful. I do not want that happening to a child. Why would you do that? And I think part of the reason that doctors believed that infants did not feel pain is two reasons. One, we, in America, people used to give birth under full anesthesia. So they would just put the mother under and then the child would come out also under full anesthesia because the mother had had it put in her system. And that's actually a really bad way to give birth. Like human beings are capable of giving birth without being injected full of anesthesia and chemicals and being basically put to sleep to do it. Why, why is it a, a bad way? Because of why, could you explain why is it bad? So it's a couple different things. Um, as a rule, generally any time that you disrupt a natural process in the body, I mean, there's, there are all sorts of things that are supposed to happen during birth for the mother and child to bond. And one of the places I'm actually speaking this later, later this year is a place called the Association for Pre and Perinatal Psychology, which is a place that, or a psychological group that focuses on the idea that what we do to children early in their life makes a significant difference. And there is a thing known as birth trauma in which people who have had particularly traumatic births have that affect them later in life in some way. So natural birth um, involves the mother, you know, having contractions and putting that child out into the world. And I think that there's actually something that disempowers women when you tell them that their body somehow doesn't work the way that it is and you need medical intervention to fix what is the natural thing that women are capable of. And there's some, you know, when that child comes out, they're meant to bond with the mother. They're meant to establish that mother infant bond and connection and trust. And when they both come out completely asleep and then the child is separated from the mother and the mother doesn't see the child for the first time until days later when they both wake up, that bond doesn't happen. So I, I actually think it disrupts some sort of connection with the mother and the child to basically put them both to sleep for that. And I feel like the underlying message of that is that women's bodies aren't capable of the one thing that only women's bodies are capable of, which is birth. So there's a sort of... Um, underlying distrust in there that I think is a really negative message and very convenient because if you don't trust women's bodies to give birth, well, you can sell women a lot of things. And, you know, the average birth in America, I think is around $30,000 to like do in a hospital. It's a lot of money. Whereas if you just believe that you could go and have a baby, you wouldn't have to give them all that money. So it's a very convenient narrative for the doctors and hospitals. Yeah, I, I was just wondering if the reason you thought it was bad was more psychological versus physical. But I, I agree with you. I understand there's what you're a, saying. There's a physical impact as well, but I have not gone through the science enough on that to be able to give you the exact impact of it. Okay. Um, and I, again, then for the aspect of you know doctors believing infants didn't feel pain, I think there's also something there where, as a group, doctors are not very good at reading non-physical cues and being emotionally present with people. You know, during, during surgery, one doctor who I interviewed, he used to do circumcisions and he said he eventually heard the cry of the baby. And when he heard that, he stopped. He didn't do them anymore. 
but he emotionally checked out every time he did the procedure. You know, he's in in medical school. He's under a lot of stress. Someone tells him to do this. You have that strong authority frame that has been studied many times in things like the Milgram experiment, mm-hmm. where you know they would give t- give people an order to do something that would harm someone else, and because a person in a lab coat with authority told them to do that, they did it. And, and doctors as a group are very risk averse people. They're people who spent four years in school and then decided to spend another four years in school and have gone down a very traditional path that is gets a lot of social approval and requires following a system for a very extended period of time. When you, when you think about who you might pick as a a rabble rouser or someone willing to overturn existing systems, the kind of person who decides to spend eight years in school is probably not that person. So, you know, as a group, doctors are, are very unwilling to look at this issue. There are a few who are really speaking out on it. There's groups like Doctors Opposing Circumcision. There's a number of celebrity doctors who've come out against it. But the establishment is very risk averse. And I think they're very risk averse in part because of the legal liability involved. So if you admit that the procedure you did was wrong, then you open yourself up to lawsuit, right? Everyone who has received that procedure has the potentiality to file a lawsuit against you. So think about the legal liability of saying that this procedure you've performed on the majority of American men Mm -hmm. was wrong and actually harmful. It would bankrupt them. And I think they're very afraid of that. And so they don't, if you look at the statement from a group like the American Academy of Pediatrics, they will say, well, there's some risks and benefits, but we leave it up to the parents to decide, which is a very convenient statement if you don't want legal liability. Yeah, actually, that talking about parents, that was the next thing I was about to ask you was what it's like not for the the children, but also for the parents, because that was also something you touched on in the film. Yeah, there's an entire community of what are known as regret parents, parents who did this procedure to their child, consented to it, and then realized it was wrong, realized that they might have actually harmed their child. And I think a lot of them feel lied to because the doctor said it won't hurt him, it's fine, it's normal, everyone does it, or the doctor did not give them any information at all. So most medical procedures, you're supposed to receive what's known as informed consent, meaning what would any reasonable person want to know about a procedure? So if you're going in to get shoulder surgery, the doctor will tell you, well, this is what we think it will do. These are the risks. Here's what's could, what could go wrong. Here's what we hope, how we hope it'll work. And basically anything you'd want to know to make an informed decision on whether or not you want that procedure. On circumcision, doctors will say, do you want your child circumcised? And that's it. There's none of the information you'd see presented in a film like mine. They aren't told that there is significant sexual sensation being removed. They aren't told even that there's a risk of the child bleeding out and dying or having major complications. It's just, would you like your child circumcised? Like, would you like vanilla or chocolate? You know, it's it's (laughs) like this very like presented as this mundane decision, but it's a surgical procedure. Right. And so I think also did you know? I think a lot of parents feel really lied to about that. Um, And on top of that, it's, you know, in the hospital system, I've heard cases of people being asked like six times, do you want this procedure done? And every time they're saying no and stop asking, like, why do you keep asking? Well, because they're trying to make a sale. It's a high pressure sales tactic being used on someone in one of the most vulnerable times of their life when they're, they're having a child. You know, I've heard of some people being asked the question when they're still in that like hypnotic days of like, Oh my God, I'm a, I'm a mother now. I'm a father now. Like, what does that mean? How is my life different? And some guy in a lab coat walks in and says, do you want your child circumcised? And it's like, I don't know. Like, what do you think? Well, there's some benefits and there's some risks, but it's up to you. Yeah. Could you give um, a summary of the arguments from people who are like, there are doctors who are for, um, circumcision or people who have been circumcised, um, um, both men and women actually that came up in film. Could you give like a, a brief summary of their arguments and what, 
I mean, I have an answer to why I would say, well, it's still wrong, but, you know, could you go into that a bit? So in America, the circumcision debate is framed by pro-circumcision groups as an analysis of risks and benefits and the idea that circumcision confers certain benefits and somehow prevents certain diseases. So their frame is that this is a preventative health measure similar to vaccines and that if you do this, your risk of certain diseases like HIV, STDs, uh, uh, urinary tract infections is reduced and that you know, it's basically negligible enough that it's up to the parent, but we think there's some benefits. That's sort of the frame that they present. Overseas, I should add, in Europe, in the rest of the world, it is not viewed that way. European medical groups have routinely condemned circumcision. There is a, a bill being explored in Iceland and Denmark, and I believe now Sweden, to potentially ban circumcision and say that you can only do it if you're a consenting adult. So if you're an adult, you're over the age of 18, you can have any procedure you want done on your body, but we think that children should be protected. But in America, they sort of frame it as this risk benefit analysis. Now, what's interesting about that frame is that we don't use it on any other part of the body. So you wouldn't ask like, what are the risks and benefits of cutting off my ear? You know, if I cut off my ear, am I gonna get less ear infections? Will I not get swimmer's ear? Um, you would just sort of assume, well, that's part of the body and it has a function, so you should keep it. And more than that, even if you were to cut off the ear to prevent those problems, you couldn't do that to someone else. That right. person might want their ear. But on this part of the body, the most sensitive part of the body, the most intimate and personal part of the body, people frame it differently. So that frame is something that a lot of activists are challenging. And you can go through the studies that they have showing supposed medical benefits. So for example, in the film, we go really deep into the HIV studies and those claims. And when you get into the data of those, I don't think the data is compelling or convincing. And there's a lot of methodological errors. There's a lot of things that don't really add up or make sense. But in order to do that, you know, how many people read academic journals and scientific studies and how many people actually go into the data table of those studies and do any kind of critical analysis. Most people read a headline that says circumcision prevents HIV. They go, well, that sounds great. I don't want HIV. I'm circumcised. Good to know. And they move on with their life, right? Right. So, and, and on top of that, even that frame is one that we don't take with any other part of the body and we don't take with women's bodies. So there's studies suggesting that female circumcision reduce, you know, female circumcised women have the lowest rate of HIV in the world, but we would never do that to women because we just feel like women have the right to their own bodies and their own choices. And even, even if those claims were true, they would not matter because that doesn't address the human rights claims and it doesn't address the sexual claims, the claims about trauma. So it is something where, I'm familiar with those studies. I can go into them. Our first edit on the HIV studies was an hour long. And we talked about how more people left those studies than stayed in. We talked about how there's dozens of, of you know, contra studies that show the opposite, including by the authors of the studies that are being used to claim it, it has benefit. Right. Um, we talked about how, uh, you know, just lots of methodological errors and the fact that the way that they were carried out, you couldn't do in the United States. You couldn't do a study where you give people the equivalent of $10,000 in free health care and then have them give you an unbiased response, right? And the moment right. you start giving that amount of money, especially to people who, you know, in parts of Africa that, that do not have the same level of wealth as Americans, you're going to have some skewed results and there's going to be a situation created where you expect people to certain people the subjects you're working with have an expectation to maybe give you the answer they want yeah i'm i'm not a fan of it at all as you would expect and i think people are getting lost in the semantics the risks versus benefits and how it might help when the issue is the human rights issue it's not your body and it's a child or it's a baby and they, they can't make these decisions and it's something that's going to impact them for the rest of their life and it's such a it's such an intimate 
experience and like um, part of the body and you touched on it a little bit but there's also it's boys so it's the male um, side of the species and you would not be making the same arguments I mean people people are outraged at people have I think they've had campaigns I've heard a lot more I mean maybe it's due to the speakers I listen to but outside of my own personal interest I know that I hear way more about female circumcision about how terrible that is usually they're talking about some part in Africa or something but it doesn't but there's a struggle and a fight to get the voice out and the word out when it comes to boys yeah, I think that has a lot to do with how our culture perceives both men, men and women. So men are seen as more expendable in some way. There's the idea of male disposability, that men are expected to do things which are unsafe for the good of the tribe. And at the same time, I think that our blind spot... Actually, I said this in, in, an, in an interview I did nearly two years ago now, I said that I thought that female circumcision would become legal in America because of our blind spot on male circumcision. And mm. now it has. So there was a recent court case overturning the federal ban on female genital cutting in America. Right, could, you give was, a, could you give a date? Uh, for the court case? Yes. It happened this winter i don't know the exact month i think it was november but i'd okay. have to check the winter but there was a yeah there was a a muslim group in michigan that practiced female circumcision specifically what's known as the ritual nick so they don't remove any tissue they just draw blood from that part of the body and there was a federal case against them and they argued they said what we are doing is less invasive than male circumcision and we have the right to practice our religion. So they made the same argument that many advocates of male circumcision make and many female circumcision groups, groups that promote female circumcision are now taking the same frame. They're saying, we think there's medical benefit to female circumcision. It's our religion. It's our tradition. It's our cultural choice. We think it looks better. All of the same arguments you see made on male circumcision are now being applied to female circumcision. And if you accept the frame that you can do genital surgeries on children, it there is a valid argument to be made that we should apply those rules equally. And so now the federal law against female circumcision has been overturned and there's a lot of groups scrambling to now put up state laws because there's only, I believe, 29 states that have a state law against female genital cutting. But I don't think those are going to hold because the equal protection argument still applies. There is still an argument to be made that you are banning one type of genital cutting practiced by one culture and one set of religions and allowing genital cutting that is practiced by another set of cultures and religions. So there's a, there's an unequal standard being applied here. And the people that want to allow male circumcision, I think are going to be willing to throw women under the bus so they can continue their genital cutting tradition. And, you know, it's, it's a slow thing happening and, and I don't like it. And it's very, I think it's very bad. But that's sort of the speed that courts move at. And there are, there's a lot of interest from, from groups against female genital cutting to maintain the same narrative because I think a lot of their funding is based in that. So if they say, hey, people who are funding our organization, we actually think that maybe you're doing something bad too, that funding might dry up and they might not receive the made, same amount of money. Um, but I think the idea that you can somehow say that it's okay to cut one gender and not another is a losing strategy that's going to cost them the gains that the movement against female genital cutting has made. And what you're seeing now is that a lot of groups are banding together on the idea of genital autonomy. The idea that you have the right to your own body. If you're 18, you can get any procedure you don't want, but children should have the right to an intact body. And they, they say that on male genital cutting, they say it on female genital cutting, they say it on intersex children, everyone has the right to the body they're born with. Yeah, uh, 
it I was just thinking that it brings up um, these really fundamental ethical questions when you were talking about male expendability I think that that has evolved through um, some biological function in terms of how the, the species you know get, gets resources for itself and reproduces and then also I was thinking about par the parent and child um, dynamic where the child is basically owned by the parent and I'm not sure that we've really had well thought out and resolved discussions as a society about these things. Right. Yes. There's been a lot of discussion around women's rights and women's issues, but we haven't really had a similar movement around men. And I think this issue is really challenging for men because men don't want a victim identity. Men do not want to be seen as weak or harmed in some way. And so admitting or talking about anything that might imply weakness or harm is really difficult for men. We socially reward men for sacrificing their comfort for the good of the tribe. So if a man works longer hours, if he does something like the military or police or firefighting in which he puts himself in harm's way for the good of others, there's a lot of social reward for that. Yeah. And if you complain or you say that somehow you've been harmed, that feels to many men a bit like the opposite of being willing to sacrifice your comfort for the good of the tribe. But on this issue, I would argue that men, by talking about it, are sacrificing their emotional comfort. They are doing something that is very uncomfortable for them, and they're doing it for the good of the tribe, for their future children, for future generations, for the protection of others. It's just okay. that because society doesn't understand this issue, we don't socially reward men for that. And yet, they are actually doing something very brave by talking about this and something that will benefit the tribe. Could you talk a bit more about the, the restoration movement and what men are doing to overcome these issues? So one of the things that I've read is that men heal differently than women. Women tend to do really well in talk therapy and men tend to want to do something in some way. They want a process they can go through. And for a lot of men, restoration is something that helps them in that way. So restoration you know, like we mentioned, there's complex nerve endings in the foreskin, and you can't get those back. Those are gone, although there may be ways to get them back in the future. So what men will do is they'll stretch the remaining skin that they have over time, just a little bit of stretching each day. And the men who do this say it's not painful, it's just a bit of tension. It would be like the way that some people, well, they put a gauge in their ear and they just stretch it over time, and then their ear becomes longer. Same principle applied, just a little bit of tension each day allows that to grow until they have something that acts like a foreskin and covers that part of the body and can do the gliding motion. And a lot of men who've done this report a significant increase in sexual sensation. So if you're circumcised, you have what's known as keratinization. It's, it's a tough layer of keratin that builds up on the skin over time. You might experience something similar to this if you work with your hands a lot and you get calluses on them or your elbow probably has a bit on it. It's just if you rub something over time, it's going to develop a layer of protection. And the foreskin is, or excuse me, the, the head of the penis is mucosal. So it's like the inside of your lip. It's meant to be slippery and wet. And if it's being rubbed against whatever you're wearing all the time, it'll develop this sort of layer of protection on it. And one of the first things that happens when you when you cover that part of the body is that that layer of keratin goes away. And so you can actually try this yourself. You could try, for example, if you're a man wearing a condom for two weeks straight or three weeks straight, and you'll lose that layer of keratin because that part of the body is no longer being rubbed and abraded. And once that happens, that part of the body is more sensitive. Plus, you get the gliding sensation of the head of the penis moving inside a sort of facsimile foreskin. So one of the people who I talked to was a guy who had had all three. He had, he had had sex intact, he was circumcised as an adult, and then he found out what a huge difference it made and restored his foreskin. And one of the things that he said, he's a bit of a legend in the foreskin restoration community, he'd said that sex intact was a 10 circumcised was a three and restored was a seven. So that sort of gives you an idea of the difference in sensation. And 
like I mentioned, it doesn't give all the sensation back, but it gives a lot. So another story that I heard as I was researching this was someone who'd been unable to have kids. He did not have the sensitivity to finish inside his wife. And after he restored, he was able to. So it's a significant difference and one that some men are doing because they want to sort of reclaim their body. They want to have the sense of power over their body. You know, as one person put it, I, I was born with a foreskin. I'll die with one. And it's just like I want that, that power and to reclaim my body in that way. And others, it's I just want the sexual sensation. I want that increased pleasure. And it's sort of different person to person, but some do get sort of a healing thing from it. Now, there is an idea of using regenerative medicine to regrow that part of the body. So people are talking about using things like stem cells. You know, we, we've used stem cells to regrow people's fingers. There was actually one case where they used stem cells to regrow the inside of a woman's vagina. So theoretically, it should be possible to do the same here. It's just that there hasn't been the demand for it or someone with the funding to accomplish it. And I think that when men raise their consciousness on this issue, when they begin collectively asking for this, there will be people who can heal it. But it requires us to first actually look at the issue and have the courage to be present with what's there now before right. we can find the future solutions. Right. Um, I want to say... Um, thank you for making your film and bringing this information out there and not just to you but to all the people who are um, because I think there are a lot of um, I don't I want to say either conscious or sensitive people or souls out there who care or would care if they knew what was going on and they first have to understand what's happening because I, I myself had an idea of what this issue was about, but I learned more information, you know, when I watched your film than I knew before. Um, something I wanted to point out was, um, I wrote a note down after watching the film that the, the size of the foreskin is about 12 square inches. Is that, is that correct? Is that, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's like, just very big. That's more it's than most two layers of skin. skin. So there's a front and back layer. And then you think about, you know, maybe that that size. Yeah, I just, just um, want people to, to keep that in mind. It's it's a lot more than you initially think, I think, at least for me. Yes. Um, and I myself have gone over what I wanted to ask you, but is there anything else that you think my audience should know or places you want to send them to do more research or things you want to ask for even? So I think that most people on an issue like this, or a lot of people, feel like there's nothing they can do. And I actually think there's a lot you can do. Um, this is an issue that, you know, when I look at the activist groups that are involved on in it, they're doing a lot with very little. And I suspect that the people in your audience all have a unique skill or superpower of some kind that they could apply to this. So... You have a YouTube channel. You're using that to educate your audience about this issue. I suspect other people who are following you have similar resources or different resources or their own unique ability. And I would just encourage them to see if there's a way they can apply those to this issue. And I would say, too, that I think a lot of people have an idea that if they talk about this issue or they explore it, that somehow they're just going to feel bad all the time. Like if I, you know, there's that stereotype of, well, I'll just spend all my time not doing anything, blaming my parents for what happened to me. And my experience has been the complete opposite. I think when you are willing to look at the things you've experienced and the shadow aspects of your own consciousness in life, then you can move past them. So I would also add to that, that if you're willing to look at this issue, there might be a brief period of grief or processing it, but when you are able to do that, you'll feel better and you'll be able to move past it. So th that would just be my encouragement for anyone willing to look at this issue that it, it could actually be something that makes your life better and gives you an opportunity to make a difference in the world. And I'd love it, obviously, if the people in your audience, you know, followed me or saw the film or got a copy or something like that. But I think more important than that is just the idea that you could make a difference on this and that that could be a fun, good process. 
Yeah, I, I completely agree. I um, I was actually just at um, the Liberty Forum, actually in New Hampshire. It was my first time putting myself out into the world and not just on a screen. And I ran into a couple of people who were um, sort of inspired by mm. what, I, what I do, which was very um, overwhelming for me. But I think a lot of people don't recognize their own ability to do things. Like you have your own connections. Um, and um, it, I think it will help you on your, I guess, developmental, self-developmental journey to do things like this. Because I think that when you explore these really um, mentally usually or emotionally painful issues, you're able to heal not just yourself but the people around you like one one little step at a time and that is how it that's how it works so i i completely agree with you and i would definitely recommend that you as in the listeners or viewers watch the film and um maybe get involved in a way that you feel comfortable with because you might not want to you know put your face out there or like get into some kind of controversy but i also i also agree with what you said and there's nothing else. Okay, maybe there's something else you want to say. Well, I was going to say, if you want to get the film, it is on circumcisionmovie.com. And you can find me at BD Murata on all social media networks. Okay. So I think that's it. Unless there's anything else you want to say, just want to make sure. I could talk for another two hours about the subject, but we'll leave it at that for now. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on my um, channel and discussing this issue. And... Um, talking to me about it and enlightening me on a lot because I didn't know a lot. Um, I also want to remind the viewers and listeners that you can support my channel by donating at justthinkingoutloud.tv slash donate to keep more content coming. And um, you can find Brendan on Twitter. I can't remember your Twitter handle, but if you just search his name. At BD Murata. So it's my first two initials and my last name. Okay. And he already said where to find the movie. So yeah. Thank yep. you for coming on. Thank you.